Hey hey, welcome to the third and final part of the Poltergeist Phenomenon series. As we have come to learn over the past two episodes of P4P, mainstream parapsychology, if there is such a thing, treats the poltergeist phenomena as a case of subconscious psychokinesis, or PK. If you haven't seen the previous episodes, I advise you to go see those first by clicking the prompt that should be appearing on the screen somewhere about now. At least if you're watching this on YouTube. I'll put the links in the description as well. But back to poltergeist being a PK phenomenon. I think this conclusion is far-fetched in the best of cases. So join me to find out why in another edition of Proof of the Paranormal in episode 45 of I'm Just Gonna Say It, The Poltergeist Phenomenon, part three, Psychokinesis versus the Survival Hypothesis. Here we go. So let me get right to the point. I think this PK explanation of the poltergeist phenomenon is really strange and an insult to deduction, honestly. Let me explain why. PK has been proven to exist, that much is true. Now there are two types that are distinguished, uh, micro-PK and macro-PK. Micro-PK means influencing very small things, like the particles that cause a quantum random number generator to output a zero or a one. Invisible stuff. Macro-PK involves moving bigger objects, Many of us possess the ability to perform micro-PK, as is shown by a lot of RNG psychokinesis experiments. Macro-PK, on the other hand, has proven to be a lot more difficult, with only a select few being able to do this successfully. And even they can at best make a, a pencil or a cigarette roll over the table, or similar stuff. In poltergeist cases, typically, a lot more is happening than some rolling pencils. Stones have even been reported to materialize in more than one cases from the ceilings of houses to name an extreme example. Now remember from the previous episodes uh, that poltergeist victims are often under great emotional stress without an outlet for that stress before the phenomena uh, start happening. Now how can one conclude that poltergeist phenomena must be the person subconsciously performing feats of PK never before seen in conscious PK in the laboratory in an attempt to vent this emotional pressure? Emotional pressure or stress which normally wreaks havoc on a person's ability to perform PK in an experimental setup. And now suddenly, it is the cause of the actual PK? There is so much wrong with that conclusion, I don't know where to start. People experiencing this are people who generally never experienced PK-like phenomena before, consciously. If we compare PK and survival, survival in this case meaning that a ghost or some other type of incarnate entity has an explanation for the events, uh, then the latter is obviously the more likely conclusion. The emotional stress could be what is making the person more susceptible to these outside influences, for instance. And then there are the rocks, which are just one example of many baffling phenomena that have been reported by multiple independent victims of poltergeist. Again, survival makes way more sense than assuming multiple people who've never talked to or seen each other all decide to subconsciously let stones rain from the ceiling. <laughs> it, it would seem more logical to me to assume that we are dealing with the same or a similar entity or one of the same species or type or whatever, at least. Another famous example was the case of Eleanor Zugun, a girl who was told by her mother that the devil was inside of her after she ate candy that she had bought with found money. She started experiencing stuff flying around the very next day and stuff flying at her. Later bite marks appeared. The saliva of the bite marks was analyzed and was different from hers. When she started getting her period, however, the phenomenon ceased. Now, Stephen Brody, a well-known parapsychologist, says this supports a PK explanation, because a general theme in poltergeist cases is that the person experiencing it is having emotional issues, and that when these issues are solved, the phenomenon generally disappear. Let's listen what he has to say. But before we do, please show your thanks for the hours I put into these videos by clicking like and sharing it on social media. Subscribe to the channel as well, if you haven't done so already, to get weekly updates when I upload a new video. Also, I would love to read your experiences with poltergeists or similar phenomena, so do leave a comment. Questions are welcome too, of course. Now on to Stephen Brody. 
the evidence more strongly, at least to me, suggests mm -hmm. that uh, the living are responsible for the phenomena. Mm -hmm. Because typically when the agent's emotional problems are resolved, as in the case of Eleanor apparently, mm -hmm. uh, the phenomena go away. Mm -hmm. So it makes more sense psychodynamically than uh, a survivalist conjecture in that case. And there's no real evidence from the poltergeist cases that somebody has survived bodily death and dissolution. Mm -hmm. So as survival cases are extremely weak, as cases of macro PK among the living, they're very strong. It's the case of Eleanor Zugun, a Romanian peasant girl who one day was walking to her grandmother's house and she found some money on the side of the road and when she arrived at her destination, she bought some sweets with the money and consumed all the sweets. And when her 105-year-old grandmother, reputed to be a witch, found out about this, she told Eleanor that uh, the money was the devil's money. And since she had eaten sweets purchased with the devil's money, the devil was now inside her and would never leave her. Mm. And the next day, phenomena began. Mm. Uh, objects were flinging themselves against the house, um, sometimes at Eleonora. And then soon thereafter, Eleonora started to break out and bite and scratch marks all over her hands and arms and face. And what made it even more peculiar, and some of this was watched very close at hand so they could see mm -hmm. that Eleonora wasn't doing this to herself. The bite marks sometimes even had um, spittle accompanying it and bacterial, bacteriological analysis was done of it, and it, it was found that the bacteriological content was different from that of Eleanor's own saliva. Yes. What's interesting about the poltergeist literature is that even though it goes back so far, um, the cases bear remarkable similarities to one another. And that's significant because the people who were reporting these unusual phenomena hundreds of years ago, there was no common body of literature mm -hmm. which they had access to. There was no received view of poltergeists at that time. Uh, in fact, these were quite independent accounts of very similar phenomena. Phenomena agree, and this is what's most interesting, in very, very peculiar details. So from these independent accounts, we see reports of the raining of stones inside a house. Uh, even more strangely, the raining of excrement inside mm -hmm. a house, the slow and gentle trajectory of um, floating objects. Yes, um, one reason is we can't predict when they're going to occur. Um, if poltergeist agents are really producing this themselves, um, we can't conclude that every teenager or adolescent or even uh, a married person in a very difficult marriage mm -hmm. uh, is going to produce these kinds of phenomena. It may just be one way of expressing emotional or psychological distress yeah. available to those people who are more psychokinetically endowed or inclined. Mm -hmm. If you ask me, that is a clear case of uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc. This stands for the logical fallacy in assuming that if A occurred after B, then B must have caused A. A helicopter view is needed to make good assumptions here, it seems. Consider the following situation. Just imagine you and a group of friends are sitting in the desert, camping around the fire. Suddenly, one of your friends drops dead, right after which a thunder-like bang is heard, reverberating through the air. As the group wonders what happens, another one falls, followed by another bang, and another one falls, and another bang. Now, the first thing coming to mind, of course, would be, oh, this must be Bill performing PK without being aware of it manifesting flying pieces of lead. After all, Bill and his wife are in turmoil since last month and he never talks about his problems. That is obviously the most simple and logical conclusion. <laughs> if you lost your marbles, that is. The logical conclusion would of course be a sniper must be hiding somewhere and taking us out. And exactly the same goes for the poltergeist example, if you ask me. Some currently unseen outside actor is the most logical explanation that requires the least amount of assumptions. Another possibility to consider is that both things are true. Each truth is but a half-truth after all, as the Hermetic Principles state. Maybe there is PK going on, but an entity is performing it, through a living person in some form of possession or oppression. That would at least uh, explain the dramatic increase in skills that have never been seen in regular PK experiments. And maybe there are certain cases where it is PK performed by the, the, the victim itself, but I would expect the majority representing cases involving outside forces. Or to make things more complicated, being an idealist, perhaps our minds create a thought form entity by believing in it, 
which in turn is responsible for the phenomena. Such a thought form or egregore is, uh, is a very old esoteric occult concept involving the creation of an entity by believing in its existence, basically. A form of PK as well, technically. Concluding PK is the sole cause, however, testifies to a definite lack in taking a bird's eye view on things, a failure to see the big picture. While not being valid as evidence, history in general and culture, myths and religious beliefs in particular should in this case be leading in forming hypotheses. But this is rarely the case. This is a problem science has in general. Too much specialization and too little or no big picture. Considering all the accounts of life after death, near-death experiences and past life memories, of ghosts and specters, of angels and demons, succubi and incubi, and all of the other creatures purported to exist by our ancestors, isn't the hypothesis that we are dealing with invisible entities way more likely than an unconscious, never-before-seen jump in psychokinetic abilities? This assumption that ancient people were that stupid as to attribute whatever they couldn't explain uh, to ghosts or divine intervention is not giving our ancestors the credit they deserve. A quick glance at some grimoires, for instance, and other spiritual texts, and one sees that the information people had about this subject back then was way too organized and elaborate uh, to be the result of some projected enigma. These texts actually suggest an understanding they had that we lack in this day and age. There are cases supporting the Piquet explanation, but there are a lot of cases refuting it as well. Carlos S. Alvarado is a research fellow at the Parapsychology Foundation and adjunct research faculty uh, at Sofia University. He's on the editorial boards of the Journal of Near-Death Studies and the Journal of the Society for Psychical Research, and is the book review editor of the Journal of Parapsychology and an associate editor of the Journal of Scientific Exploration. Let's listen to what he has to say about uh, noisy ghosts. In, in many different ways, always to maintain the general point that the human spirit was real, that all, all these phenomena were, the, were produced by the human spirit, and as such, they indicated that we have a non-physical component that will survive bodily death. And it put together everything from clairvoyance, premonitions, uh, xenoglossy, you know, all kinds of... Um, Almost any type of psychic phenomena you can think, he conceptualized them like that. So mm -hmm. they, they, he had that common thread, but inside each of the phenomena, there is an incredible richness that I will say that even to this day, very few people have worked in trying to, to illustrate all these features of the phenomena, all the different variations of apparitions, of, of telepathic messages, of, of almost any phenomena you can think about. That's one of the things that have always interested me greatly about him, that to read him is, is a great experience in, in learning about the variety of psychic phenomena. Transfiguration. I was recently citing a, a, an article, he published a multi-part article in 1934 in Italian on that topic, and that later became a book. Transfiguration is a, considered a phenomenon of physical mediumship and uh, is basically the idea that you are there sitting with a medium in front of you and the facial features of the medium change. So in the, in the best cases, you are looking at the medium and you see that the medium all of a sudden resembles the spirit of someone that, that you knew you know, your father that is deceased or a brother or something like that. Not, not all the cases are that good. Sometimes the change is just very slight, but there are many variations, you know, and, and he classify all those variations inside the, the science room context. Yeah, he, he believed that all that was directed by intelligences from the other world, you know, the spirits, of the disease that basically used the medium to produce the phenomena. He accepted the idea that was very common from, from the 19th century till even till today, that the medium will produce, a, that the spirits were able to use the physical force housed inside the body of the medium. And not only the medium, also of the sitters. There is a lot in the old psychical research literature about how psychic forces were very dynamic and move all around in sense uh, context. 
And in this case, it was the spirits who were manipulating that to change the features of the of the medium. In other occasions, uh, it was the same process, but to produce materializations outside of the body of the medium. So hands will appear or faces outside of the medium, complete uh, body figures, and so forth. Like what we see in the records of of you know the mediumship of Didi Hume, and Sapia Palladino, Franek Klosky, many many of the old uh, physical uh, mediums. Uh, yeah, yes, he focused quite a bit on the. A lot of, of the phenomena that, that he explored, like transfiguration, materializations, uh, they're still reported today, but perhaps not as frequently as in the old days, but. There is a lot of aversion to, you know, get close to that type of phenomena because, first of all, they look weird. They look, sometimes they look ridiculous. They look frightening. They look, and a lot of people don't want to think much about it. But Bozzano and, and many others at the time were fully convinced that physical mediumship and materialization specifically was a real phenomena. And uh, there were too many manifestations to be ignored. What was more controversial among the specialists at the time was the explanation. You know, some of them were like Bozzano, but the spirits are the intelligence behind it. Others will say, yeah, there is intelligence, but it's the medium's intelligence. The unconscious mind of the medium is shaping these figures. And also the beliefs of the circle affect the phenomena. And actually, Bozzano accepted that. He, he wrote about the power of the mind of the medium to, to imprint things outside the body in, a, in, in the so-called ectoplasm, which is you know, the, the exteriorized uh, force of the medium, but made visible. So he, he believed in that, but what, what he would strongly defend against those that said that he was only the unconscious of the medium was that he would say, yes, sometimes that is true, but there are many other occasions where the spirits of the dead are behind the phenomena. And he gave many reasons, you know, why. I think it is safe to conclude that both processes exist, as well as mix-up of the two, perhaps. Most common, however, is the presence of an outside agent or entity. In the cases where PK does seem to be the culprit, which are rare, the object or victim often has prior experiences with PK. And taking a wider perspective, there is so much circumstantial evidence for the survival of consciousness after death that it deserves more attention. A theory's falsifiability should never determine its appeal, in spite of what Karl Popper says. If we can't falsify a hypothesis now, we might be able to later. The mother of all unfalsifiable theories is of course idealism. Assuming it is correct, if you don't believe things work that way after all, then they probably won't. Or you are at least influencing things to look like they don't, in an experimenter effect type manner. In a way, life is a big collective self-fulfilling prophecy. But that's for another episode. And on that note, we end this one. Join me again next week for another edition of uh, Utopolis One. The week after that will be another special edition of Proof of the Paranormal, about the science of magic. Featuring an interview with a very special guest. You do not want to miss that one. Until the next one, cultivate compassion, keep meditating, and keep questioning the narrative. Love y'all, be die, bye bye. Secrets lie in the border fires in the humming